welcome you all to Gettysburg National Military Park's 155th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg and to the 2.30 p.m. real-time program on the, the division of Robert Rhodes. My name is Philip Brown. I've been a park ranger here for about six years. And uh, this story that we're going to be talking about today has always been rather uh, near and dear to my heart. It's something that I heard about on my first visit to the battlefield when I was eight years old. And one reason it's so near and dear to my heart is because we're going to be talking about a lot of guys from my home state of North Carolina. Uh, the subject of this program is something I've been doing a lot of reading about, a lot of studying about most of my life. So much so that when I got married in 2016, my wife said we should get a cat. And I had a couple of stipulations. It had to be a gray male, and its name is Ramser. So if you come into my house and you see my cat misbehaving, you might hear me yelling Stephen D at him, because that's what I call him, he's getting into trouble. But uh, no, this, uh, this talk is really going to be, uh, I'm going to call it a microcosm. What happens to this division on July 1st, 1863, is really a representative sample of a problem that the Confederate Army is going to have throughout the entire campaign and Battle of Gettysburg. It's a problem of no communication or coordination between brigades trying to fight here on July 1st. So I guess it's fitting that this story begins with a meeting, a meeting that takes place among four officers quite a ways northeast of here in a crossroads called Heidlersburg, Pennsylvania. And attendance at this meeting in the night of June 30th was Richard Ewell, the second Corps commander of the Confederate Army, and two of his division commanders, Jubal Early and Robert Rhodes himself. The fourth officer you might would expect would be his third division commander, but it's instead a man named Isaac Trimble, who is marching with the Second Corps as a supernumerary, meaning he's an officer who doesn't technically have a command of his own. He was wounded severely in August of 1862 on the Second Manassas Campaign, and he's just now recovering from that wound in June of 1863, eager to rejoin the Army of Northern Virginia and get in on the coming action. He's first going to meet up with Robert E. Lee's headquarters before eventually being reassigned to Richard Ewell. And at this meeting that's going to take place in Heidlersburg on the night of June 30th, these four officers are going to be discussing a communication that they have received from Robert E. Lee. And the communication is going to concern their movements the next day, where the Corps should be headed on the morning of July 1st. The communication is going to state that the men should move towards Cashtown or Gettysburg as the circumstances might dictate. And that last part is really going to leave Richard Ewell scratching his head. What in the world does Robert E. Lee mean as the situation or as the circumstances might dictate? Isaac Trimble is going to claim years after the war that the circumstances that Lee was talking about was the Union Army's arrival in Gettysburg, meaning we should move as quickly as possible to Gettysburg. How Isaac Trimble would have ever known any location of any Union units on the evening of June 30th is beyond me, but that's what he claimed years after the war. Nevertheless, by the conclusion of the meeting, Richard Yule has put together a plan of march for the morning of July 1st. The plan is to move his men primarily to the west, headed towards Cashtown. But these two division that was, divisions that we've been talking about, they're going to march on two different roads. Uh, Jubal Early is going to be moving towards Cashtown via Hunterstown and Mummisburg, and Robert Rhodes is going to be taking a more direct route to the west up north of here, riding modern day 234 directly towards Cashtown from Heidlersburg via Middletown, what we call Biglerville today. The reason Yule chose to move the divisions on two different roads was maybe not to clog up the roads themselves tremendously, but also to give them the opportunity for both of these divisions to simultaneously turn south if the situation dictated that they needed to move towards Gettysburg instead of Cashtown. And that's exactly what happens. The Corps is on the move by the morning of July 1st. Robert Rhodes got underway sometime around daylight. Jubal Early is going to be on the road by 8 o'clock in the morning with his men. They're going to be marching along for a couple of hours, and eventually they receive a communication not from Robert E. Lee, but instead from A.P. Hill. And this communication is going to inform Yule that A.P. Hill is now moving his men from Cashtown to the west of Gettysburg towards the town itself. And Yule is going to take that to be the catalyst. That's going to be the circumstances. That's going to be what dictates his movement. He's going to decide that rather than going towards Cashtown, he's going to march on Gettysburg. 
This is happening just as Robert Rhodes' men are beginning to approach Middletown, and so that's going to allow them to make the left-hand turn onto the Carlisle Road, which is going to bring them right here into Gettysburg. Carlisle Road's running just behind you guys over here. Robert Rhodes' division, very interesting unit in the Confederate Army. It's a very large division. Robert Rhodes, 34 years old at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, started out the war in charge of the 5th Alabama Infantry. Here at Gettysburg, he's got nearly 8,000 men in his command split into five brigades. One of those brigades is made up of all Georgia men, commanded by George Doles. He's got about 1,700 men in his command, excuse me, 1,300 men in George Doles' brigade. Doles, before the war, is a businessman and a captain of a local militia company. At the beginning of the war, he's made the colonel of the 4th Georgia and will rise through the ranks, eventually commanding a brigade here at Gettysburg. Then we have, of course, Robert Rhodes' old brigade itself, an all-Alabama brigade, commanded by a man named Edward O'Neill. Edward O'Neill, somewhat of a checkered past in the Confederate Army leading up here to Gettysburg. He was in charge of this brigade of Alabamians at Chancellorsville, so he is considered the permanent brigade commander of this unit. Brigades, of course, traditionally commanded by brigadier generals. However, Robert E. Lee himself has blocked Edward O'Neill's promotion from colonel to brigadier general. There's something about him that Robert E. Lee just doesn't care for. There's about 1,700 men in this Alabama brigade. The rest of the brigade is going to be made up of about 4,500 North Carolinians split into three units. One of them commanded by Alfred Iverson. Alfred Iverson is a Georgian by birth. He has 1,300 Tar Heels in his unit here on July 1st, 1863. He's not very well liked by his men for a couple of different reasons. There might be a little bit of nativism among this unit. Maybe they don't care for the fact that a Georgian is their commanding officer. It's also said that his dad had good friends in Richmond. And there were other men better fit for brigade command over Alfred Iverson. But nonetheless, he's their brigade commander. Then we have the largest brigade of the entire division, a little over 2,000 men, commanded by Junius Daniels. Junius Daniel is new to the Army of Northern Virginia. In fact, the entire brigade is. They have not been with Robert E. Lee's Army until the Gettysburg Campaign. They're added to the Army in an attempt to beef up the ranks just before the invasion of the North. So this unit's brand new to the Army. Then we have what is probably the most proficient, the most skilled brigade commander in the entire division, Stephen Dodson Ramser himself. Stephen Dodson Ramser is an 1860 West Point graduate, beginning of the Civil War. He's in command of a battery of artillery, but eventually was switched to infantry, and he has here at Gettysburg about a thousand North Carolinians. About two miles before this division reached Gettysburg, they're going to run into the pickets and vedettes of Thomas Devon's Federal Cavalry Brigade strung out here on the north side of the town of Gettysburg. It's a fairly short fight. Devon's uh, casualties are not very heavy. He's actually giving a great deal of ground as he falls back into the town of Gettysburg. And eventually, Robert Rhodes and Richard Ewell will arrive here on Oak Hill. Oak Hill looks kind of like it did in 1863. Uh, the woods that you see behind us here, uh, in appearance, look very different. You've probably heard this if you go on some of my other talks. Almost all of the wooded area in Gettysburg is all going to be grazed by livestock in 1863. So that means the undergrowth doesn't really exist in the 1863 wood lines. Uh, it gives the men nice field of view. You could see one or 200 yards through the woods. It makes it very good for deploying a division under cover. So this division is going to begin to build its battle line on these wooded areas on the back side of the hill. Now when Robert Rhodes gets here, he's going to immediately look to the south in this direction and one thing that's really going to catch his attention, and it's going to be uppermost in his mind throughout this entire attack, and it is the exposed flank of the Federal First Corps. He arrives here about 1.30 in the afternoon. The First Corps battle lines are being built very rapidly by this point. They're, they're fairly well uh, in position. But the real area he's looking at is actually pretty far off in the distance. He's eyeing up the railroad cut. From his perspective, that is the flank of the First Corps. Uh, the situation has not unfolded quite in the way it's going to throughout the rest of the day. There are no Union soldiers over here on Oak Ridge, right at the base of Oak Hill. And the 11th Corps has not yet deployed over here on what we call the Gettysburg Plain. They're still in the town of Gettysburg. So for Robert Rhodes, he has a prime opportunity in front of him. He has 8,000 men to attack the flank of the 1st Corps by the railroad cut. So he's immediately going to set about accomplishing that objective. That's his goal here 
on Oak Hill. To do that, he's going to begin to deploy his division out. Now, if he's going to attack directly to the south into the First Corps, he can't just rush his entire division down there. He's got to watch his flanks. And so he's going to post Dole's brigade on his left over here on the Gettysburg Plain. They're actually going to be in a, a fairly large skirmish line stretching from here all the way out and up and over Barlow Knoll. So we're going to have Dole's brigade watching the left. O'Neill's Alabama Brigade is going to be deployed in the woods on the other side of Oak Hill from where we're standing right now. Over here on this part of the hill, it's going to be Alfred Iverson's Brigade, again deployed like the rest of the division under the cover of woods. And then further off to the right, stretching all the way out to what we call Hare's Ridge Road today, would be Daniel's Brigade, also under the cover of woods. They're not visible to the Union First Corps. So you could say that Rhodes has the opportunity for surprise, I would argue that Devon's Cavalry Brigade has probably ruined any element of surprise, but it's going to be completely ruined by Rhodes' deployment of his artillery. He's got a battalion of artillery commanded by Thomas Carter. They're going to unlimber right here in front of the infantry on Oak Hill and open fire on the 1st Corps and also begin to open fire on some of the lead elements of the 11th Corps coming from the town of Gettysburg. An artillery duel is going to unfold between Federal and Confederate guns. Uh, Thomas Carter's battalion is actually going to suffer heavy here on July 1st. Uh, they're going to take about 77 casualties. That's the second highest percentage of casualties in any artillery battalion in the Confederate Army. It's about 20% of his men are wounded or killed here in this artillery duel. They're going to fall back into the woods before the attack begins. But the firing of the Confederate artillery here has now alerted the 1st Corps to a rival of Robert Rhodes' division here in the woods. So they're immediately going to react to that. And John Robinson's division is going to begin to begin uh, moving in this direction. Uh, Henry Baxter's brigades are arriving. Gabriel Paul's men are beginning to arrive. They're getting ready to face this new threat along Oak Ridge with the arrival of the Confederates here. Uh, after that artillery duel has been going on for a short while, uh, Rhodes is going to begin to commit his men to the fight. It's taken about an hour to get this division online and ready for the fight. I cannot stress to you just uh, how large scale this fight is really gonna be. We often get up here and we talk about Rhodes' division and we reduce it to Oak Hill. No, uh, Rhodes' division is gonna take up a mile long front stretching from Hare's Ridge Road to Barlow's Knoll. It's gonna take a great deal of time to get them in order. The brigade that's gonna lead the attack is gonna be his old brigade. Edward O'Neill's men are gonna be the first to get in on the action, emerging from the woods on the other side of Oak Hill. They're sort of in an odd deployment. They're on a slope as it, the ground drops off down there to the Gettysburg Plain. And the attack is also gonna happen piecemeal. Not the entire brigade moving forward, but just three regiments of it. Why is this happening? Well, Edward O'Neill would tell you that Robert Rhodes told him that he would be holding out two regiments. 5th Alabama and the 3rd Alabama from the fight. That's only going to leave O'Neill three regiments, the 6th, 12th, and 26th Alabama to go into this fight. That's going to be easy pickings for Baxter's men waiting for them along the Mummusburg Road. They're going to be repulsed fairly shortly after their attack begins. Eventually, Rhodes is going to ride over and find out what in the world's going on on this side of the hill. He finds those Alabama soldiers falling back. He expected to find O'Neill out there with him, but O'Neill has stayed out of the fight. He's back with the 5th Alabama. Why did he do that? Well, he said that Robert Rhodes told him he would be there in person commanding this attack. So O'Neill's is trying to absolve himself of the entire fight. Eventually, the 5th Alabama is going to be committed to the fight as well, but it's too late at that point. O'Neill's men are falling back. That's only going to lead to the next brigade in line. This brigade, of course, Alfred Iverson's men deployed behind most of you over in this direction. They have an interesting position over there because they can't see what's just happened to O'Neill. Oak Hill and this piece of high ground that the Tour Road runs along, some people call it the western arm of McPherson's Ridge or Forney Ridge, it's going to block their view of what's happening to O'Neill. What Iverson can see is the battle smoke rising from this fight. And these brigades are probably large enough that the battle smoke itself took on a linear fashion. He might could see two lines of smoke rising out of the low ground behind me. That's going to compel Iverson not to attack directly south, but instead to turn his attack and begin moving east, hoping to hit the flank of whatever just hit O'Neill. Of course, we know that's not exactly what Iverson runs into. His 1,300 North Carolinians come out of the ground behind the Peace Memorial, descend into the low ground, and as they march forward, they just happen to fall into a very dangerous trap. 
Shortly after the Federal soldiers defeated O'Neill, they changed front to the west, came up onto Oak Ridge, just as Iverson's men are getting into the lowest part of the ground. They're going to be within 150 yards or so of Baxter's men when they rise up from behind the ridge and open fire. Numbers for what happened to Iverson's men kind of range all over the place. I would not doubt it's about 500 casualties in about 15 minutes' time. It's an utter disaster for Alfred Iverson and his men. And in the chaos of battle, they're looking around for where their brigade commander is, and he's not down in the field with them. Like O'Neill, he has stayed back away from the fighting, and he's never going to live that down, this reputation with his men. We're going to leave Iverson's men down in the low ground struggling. Some of them are beginning to try to surrender. Casualties are growing higher and higher and higher, but we have another brigade moving out. This, of course, is that massive North Carolina brigade commanded by Junius Daniel. Daniel is going to focus almost all of his energy towards the railroad cut, that initial point that Robert Rhodes had focused on in deploying this division. His 2,000-man unit is going to cut across these open fields in front of you, and they're going to end up making three distinct attacks on the railroad cut, each of them costing these North Carolinians a tremendous number of casualties. In the end, they're going to be successful in gaining the railroad cut, though. You could say they might do the best of all of the brigades in terms of the ground they cover and the casualties they inflict. As Daniels is moving forward and attacking the railroad cut, he has an extra unit with him, though. This unit we haven't quite mentioned. It was detached from O'Neill's men, not the 5th Alabama, the 3rd Alabama. Just before Daniels stepped off, he realized the 3rd Alabama was standing by. It's been detached and sent over to his end of the line. So he's going to decide that as he moves forward, he's going to have the 3rd Alabama watch his left flank. One thing to keep in mind in this attack Iverson's men are not yet in trouble. Everything is happening kind of at the same time. So as Daniels moves forward, the 3rd Alabama's on his left, they're looking out for trouble. They see Iverson move forward, they see Iverson taking tremendous casualties, and then they see something else happening. They see Baxter's men coming off of Oak Ridge and beginning to capture the North Carolinians and Iverson's brigade. They then begin to see Baxter's men firing from the low ground up at the 3rd Alabama in this open field in front of you. So suddenly they have a dilemma in front of them. What do you do? Do you hold your fire because there's Confederates down there? Or do you defend yourself against this federal attack that's now coming your way? Eventually the decision is made to open fire. And unfortunately, it's a lot of friendly fire that happens between the 3rd Alabama and Iverson's men here on July 1st. Working our way back up the line, Robert Rhodes is here on the hill. He sees that Iverson's men are in trouble. He sees that O'Neill is not doing very well at all. So he's going to make the decision to commit the final brigade in this attack that he has at his disposal. It's the brigade that's been leading up the rear in the entire march. It's Stephen Dodson, Ramser's 1,000-man North Carolina Brigade. Ramser's men are basically going to follow in the footsteps of both O'Neill and Iverson, but they're not going to make the same mistakes that those men make. He's going to deploy his men across the brow of this hill, allowing him to see both sides of Oak Hill when they move forward. The 1,000 men in Ramsar's brigade are going to begin to move out. At this point in the story, Daniels now has his lodgment in the railroad cut. At this point in the story, the Iron Brigade is probably beginning to fall out of Herp's Woods. At this point in the story, Doles and Gordon have gotten together with the arrival of Jubal Early's division, and they've begun to smash the 11th Corps deployment that's taken place as well. The Union Army is not in good shape. John Robinson is going to begin to pull his men off of Oak Ridge, but he's going to tell one regiment, the 16th Maine, to stay behind and try to buy a little bit of time for the Union Army to get out. Unfortunately, the 16th Maine is in the wrong place at the wrong time as Ramser comes down and a hammer blow on his men. 16th Maine is going to retreat. Ramser is going to sweep across Oak Ridge, push completely through the wood line we see in the distance, and connect with Daniels there at the railroad cut before turning to the left and sweeping through the town of Gettysburg. Rhodes Division, make no mistake about it here at Gettysburg, accomplishes their objectives on July 1st, 1863, but their attack happens in a piecemeal and disjointed fashion. No two brigades are really talking to one another at any point in the fight, and because of this, their casualties are going to be exceptionally high. Dole's Brigade is going to end up losing 219 men of 1,300 brought into the fight, 16% casualties in Dole's Brigade. Ramser's Brigade, 26% casualties. O'Neill's Brigade, 41% casualties. Daniel's Brigade, 45% casualties. 926 men of 2,052 brought to the fight. 
Iverson's brigade, 903 casualties of 1,384 brought to bear, a loss of 65%. The damage that they do to the Union Army is going to cost them dearly, and it's going to make this division more or less ineffective. O'Neill's men and Daniel's men are going to participate in some of the fighting on Culp's Hill, but the rest of the division is going to be responsible for holding the line in the town of Gettysburg throughout the Battle of Gettysburg. Hope you guys have enjoyed this little shortened 97 degree program we've given here on July 1st, 1863. I'll be around here in the shade to chat and ask, answer any more questions you might have. Uh, but please keep yourself cool, look after yourself, and enjoy the rest of these real-time programs. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>